All right, good morning. So this is uh, year 482 CMOS VLSI. Uh, welcome back from break. I hope you enjoyed it. It's <laughs> over. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Dr. Morrison. Um, I responded to that just fine. Um, I don't insist that you call me Dr. Morrison. Um, most of you have either had it for computer architecture or for advanced digital systems. So the general idea of what came up in that course we started at MSI level, which is medium scale electrician, 10 to 100 transistors, putting together gates, then building up to arithmetic logic and its controllers, and then building up to this concept called VLSI, which stands for very large scale integration. So now you know what the second half of that CMOS VLSI stands for. In this course, we're going to start at the transistor level and build up. So we're actually, in the first few lectures, we're actually going to learn how a transistor works on MOSFET. As for metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. So CMOS, the general idea is that you have to work on complement. You have a pull-up network using positive metal oxide semiconductors, and you have negative metal oxide semiconductors, and they work in complement, CMOS, complementary metal oxide semiconductor. So you work these pull-up and pull-down networks, and we're going to be building this up. In this course, we're going to start to be taught about uh, length and Wave ratios and transistors, and how that impacts the ability of uh, the circuit to be able to go from a zero to one in a certain amount of time. How much uh, that, uh, well, what's the current that needs to be applied in order to make that occur? Um, and then you're going to start putting those together and be building cells that gate certain logics that you can actually use to put together to build a much larger circuit. From there, we're going to be learning layout. Uh, additionally, we're going to be going over uh, Verilog. Uh, for those of you that uh, that course last semester, we did VHDL, which is uh, an acronym within an acronym, very high speed hardware description language. Um, in this course, we're going to learn something called Verilog, which is a little different. Um, it's another hardware description language. It's a type of language we actually lay it out. Um, if you're using uh, a hardware description language to lay out an embedded system, like on a Board or a Raspberry Pi or anything like that. Well, Raspberry Pi you probably use C, but if you're laying out an embedded system board, you probably use VHDL, which is very good with coordinating pins. If you're taking a hardware description language and synthesizing it down to an actual chip, like we're going to learn about in this lab, Verilog is a much better way. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a, a, a simple version of Verilog. Um, all of you take my course to recognize the term MIPS. Okay, so if you actually kind of gone through the textbook, you see that this course actually teaches a uh, kind of an overview of a form of this called a multi-cycle. And you can actually make a simple VHD and I'll put a simple Verilog code, which I'll show you how to do. Uh, and then you can take that and synthesize it. There's a framework called electric. Then you put that, it'll actually show you the chip, it'll show you how much power you consume, show you the area, shows you the exact layout, I'll show you examples in the lecture. So I don't want this course to be as uh, work intensive as the uh, advanced digital systems course was, but I don't think that's a required course. For this course, I want you guys to get familiar with certain tools. We're going to learn about HVACE, we're going to learn some very long, uh, you know, get familiar with uh, electric, so that way you can build your resume, so that way you start interviewing for jobs, you can have a really strong background for the number of tools. If you say you can do the number of tools, become more desirable to employers. Um, now, most, for those of you who've taken my course before, you recognize the terms topics, bad objectives, and sample questions. For those of you who haven't, these are daily assignments. So you're every day, I insist they're handwritten because they stick in the head better. Um, during, the, during the lecture, I'll actually indicate, let me scroll down a little bit. So, first two genomes, one point. Define and differentiate between small scale integration, medium scale integration, large scale integration, and very large scale integration, right? You know, when I write this out, and you notice in Blackboard, so this is the undergraduate section under content, I have the syllabus, topical bad objectives, example questions. I'm going to call this extra credit for graduate students. This is a required thing. Um, but at the top of the ad objectives, we go to section one. I'm finishing up the course, but section 1.1 is going to correlate directly to what's in the lecture. This is done so that way you can study and build up the fundamentals that you will need to do more complex problems that you will need to understand. Additionally, by looking at this, you 
will know precisely how I answer questions. So there's no, I think there's no ambiguity. I want people to know precisely what I'm asking so that way they can give me the precise answer. My job is to, pay, to put the knowledge into your head and then prove it's there. So if I ask you ambiguous questions or questions that don't make sense, if, then I, have, I haven't necessarily proven that the knowledge is not in your head. So this is my way of helping you be straightforward. Um, I, I already mentioned a lot of the reasons why your systems are handwritten because it stays on your writing better. The other one is uh, to prevent uh, what I call academic bullying. And I'm not really worried about anybody in this class. I've heard all good things about all of you, but the general, what happened the first semester when I uh, used the teaching method, I allowed the students to type it, and what happened was one of the students was saying, give me your credit before they can handing it as well. And so what I want to make sure is that uh, nobody feels as though they are being compelled to do somebody else's work for them. The easiest way for me to ensure that is to insist that homework is handwritten. The next part is example questions. So these are things that we actually cover in class as well. So in the first section, the first section is going to be draw two input NAND gate using a CMOS pull up pull down network using a transistor. What the CMOS actually means. And so, uh, in example 1.1, when we actually get there, you'll ask. I'll get two questions that come up. When you get to see it, the whole step is you actually kind of work through it, and the problems build up. And there are lots of these combined concept questions that are very good questions for examination. So, see if you remember the fundamentals you need to do the example questions. The example questions are already being put together for strong examples. Uh, where did it be um, I'm not sure yet. I'm finishing up the uh, project descriptions this weekend. So, uh, how many of you have those? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Um, so that's 11. So, that's, I'm still waiting to turn out. There's um, a course that there's students, there might be a couple more students registering so that way I can figure out precisely the ratio of what uh, groups I want to create. There will also be other, actually, for the, there, will, there will be some local groups that just need to know the number. There's going to be two things we're going to be working on this kind of coding project. And there's also going to be something we're going to be working with. Each group is going to be doing blogging on a website called SendWiki. And it's run by a, a gentleman named Dr. Daniel Nenny, who is the innovator of what's known as Fabulous Design. So if you don't have a fabrication lab, there's, there's only a few fabrication labs. But you, know, it's have, you want to design a computer chip, you're going to use a lot of these tools that we're doing. And the innovator of this is Daniel Nen. He's wrote a very famous book called Fabulous. And he runs a site for professionals uh, who work on this type of work called Web Semi Week. And uh, when I met him this summer, um, I was talking to him about possibly bringing, having students work on it. And he's been dying to try to get universities to do this follow up. So what's going to happen is a couple, your, your groups are going to pick a project. And you're starting by writing a 500 words, 1,000 word blog post. And Dr. Nanny's going to encourage the professionals on there to do commenting on it and interact with you over the course of the semester. So get you in contact with professionals, people who might be able to give you jobs, give you advice, give you knowledge, things that you didn't understand, things you didn't know. And in the last couple of weeks, the groups are going to present what they learned during the seven week posts. So that way, you're Things that are just outside of the scope of what you're going to find in the textbook. Um, so, I'll, I'll get to that. Um, I just got the, uh, the code this morning. When you register, you're going to, uh, you'll, re you'll register on the website. You'll say that I referred you, and then he will approve you. So, now you have an in that no other CMOS student in the country has. So, um, this thing I have here. Um, that called extra credit. Basically, what's going to happen is in the course of the lecture, it's going to say grad 1.1, 1 .1, grad 1.2, kind of that, that kind of thing, because for graduate students, it's going to be required. What this is is they're asking one to two paragraphs of either a video. For example, 1.2 is a video showing out the uh, fabrication process for Intel's 22 nanometer transistor. 1.1 is a write-up on uh, the differences between CMOS transistor, what's known as a FinFET transistor. Uh, for graduate students, I insist it's going to be interned in along with the top of a graduate. For undergraduates, 
this is extra credit opportunity. So you can do this and every kind of add a number of top of which items extra point. Um, and this will help you learn some things that are not necessarily in CMOS. So we hopefully, if you take advantage of that opportunity, you could be even more well rounded. So I'm going to try to pick some things that are recent uh, that people in the industry are talking about that you might want to know about. So. Okay, does anybody have any questions before I kind of jump in and all that? Oh, yeah, don't cheat. <laughs> I don't think that would be one of the problems. Uh, so, uh, anything else? Okay, good one. What's that? Oh, yeah, pizza party. Uh, last day of semester. Um, so, the undergrads will be presenting on second week, the grad students. Oh, no, that, that's actually in the syllabus. Um, and grad students will uh, present on a paper from IEEE, kind of a recent research project. Um, there will also be, at the end of the semester, by that point, we'll have all the exams done, you'll have done your presentation, and I will have your final grades ready to go. I will have pizza ready for you. You'll eat pizza, and then I'll call people up to the front, I'll look you square in the eye, and tell you what your final grade is. And that's a personal integrity thing for me. Um, I know professors back here at the uh, University of Mississippi, but elsewhere, who have given students grades that they didn't deserve for a variety of reasons. Grudges, they don't like so and so. Um, it's important that I have the personal integrity to look square in the eye and tell you this is a decision I made that will impact your future. Right? So. And also, you get pizza, so <laughs> that's a plus. So. Yes. For all of the other content on Blackboard, the talking about objectives, example questions, extra credit, those are all listed under the feature folder. And as we go through the course of the semester, I'll update them by section. And so what's going to happen is you can actually refer back to them. Uh, I am recording the lectures. So Post them on um, Blackboard. I will post the assignment. So the topic will be one point one through one point six, or whatever we cover today during the lecture, or the end of that example question. I will post that, and I will post the link to the YouTube page, so you can actually go back, read through that, and you have the links available, uh, so that way you can study for exams. Um, I do not. The one thing I, I'm adamant about is I don't post the PDF notes uh, because then that you, those get passed around. If you come to class regularly, I'll help you. If you skip my class a lot, not so much. Fair? So, uh, so yeah, that's how, that's how it works. So, I, I send out an um, kind of email notification every time, so you'll have the, the, the homework. Um, any other questions before we begin? Okay, so this is CMOS. Um, this is a picture of an example of the very first point contract transistors developed at uh, Bell Labs. The two people who developed their name, John Bardem and Walter Bertain, they won a Nobel Prize for designing it. In the act, it almost became a classified military secret, but they decided to publicly introduce it. And the actual wording uh, from the paper. They said, we have called it the transistor, and they actually took it out to spell out transistor, even though the wording for transistor is right next to it, because people apparently can't spell the words they just read. Um, because it is a resistor or semiconductor device, which an amplified electrical signal, which I'm sorry, which amplifies electrical signals as they are transferred through it from the input to the output. So they won the Nobel Prize for this. And so this gentleman here is a guy named Jack Kilby. And he's the first person to invent an integrated circuit and he moved it at Texas Instruments. And what happened at the time is before the integrated circuit with the silicon chip was done, there's this problem called the tyranny of numbers. And it meant that computer engineers and the electrical engineers saw that every single component in a computer chip had to be connected to every other component of the computer chip. That's why these computers that you see from like the 50s and 60s were these huge, like fill up entire rooms. Because they felt they had to connect all of them. So, what he did is he actually just manufactured the circuit on mass on one piece of silicon semiconductor, and that allowed them to actually just have the circuit flow logically the way you have 
more in 10 years versus now. And this year, and Jack Philby received the Nobel Prize in 2000 for this. And this is the actual picture of the first integrated circuit. That was designed by Texas Instruments. Uh, designed by Jack Philby's execution. For those of you who've taken advanced digital systems, uh, or probably even you know JK flip flops, JK flip flops were also invented by Jack Philby. Uh, he was just messing around trying to improve on test latches and beam flip flops and came up with the JK flip flop because it covers all the possible input um, input and output combinations and eliminates the uh, toggling from special uh, beam flip flops. So, same guy who invented the integrated circuit was the same guy who invented the JK flip flop. Okay, so uh, TGO 1.1 uh, small scale, medium scale, large scale, and very large scale. Small scale is a lot of circuits that use less than or equal to 10 transistors. It's kind of just a number to figure out. You can think of this as a chart. Medium scale takes from 10 transistors to 100 transistors. So as a small scale, so I'll show examples of small scale, medium scale, large scale, and very large scale integration. You can think of this hardware, NAND gates, NAND gates, all of these logic circuits that require less than 10 transistors. Once it becomes greater than 10 transistors, use MSI circuits. So you're putting gates together to build logic. So full ladders, full subtract, excuse me, uh, comparators, things, things of that nature, decision circuits. Once you get to large scale of integration, that's where you start creating control units, arithmetic logic units, macro set elements, registers. And as you put all these together to form a data path for a computer, this is when you get to the very large scale integration. So that's when you're getting to greater than or equal to 1,000 transistors. So LSI is 100 to 1,000, MSI is 10 to 100, and LSI, small scale, oh, sorry, small scale of integration, SSI is less than 10, or less than or equal to 10. All right, so this is an example of an, an inverter here at the bottom of the page. So this is an example of a pull up and pull down network. This here is what's known as a PMOS transistor, and this is what's known as an NMOS transistor. And the idea is you think of them as actually like switches, like light switches, where the idea is you want a zero on the input and a one on the output, an inverter. Now we have VDD, which is the supply voltage, which is the logic one. So we want this to flow through here when the input is zero. And when the input is one, we want this VSS, which is ground, which is logic zero, to flow through the NMOS transistor. So we're going to define a PMOS transistor as a strong passer of zeros, meaning that this is what's known as the gate. And if zero is put on the gate of the PMOS transistor, it will pass whatever value is on it from the source to the drain. So if you're here, you have a hookup to one. So if we put a zero on the input, it's strong, it'll pass the value to the one. And NMOS is weak when it when a one value book. Meaning that we're gonna learn about protocol channels. It does not allow it to go through. So they won't mess with each other, which means that one will on the output here. When you have this deep, um, when I have one on the input, PMOSs are weak. NMOS is strong, so this cuts off. The zero comes through here, and then you have the zero on the output. So that's how the transistor actually works. So this is an example of a small scale integration circuit. That wasn't went a lot for detail uh, in this course about the actual physics behind how that works. So MSI. So this is 10 to 100. So we have some small examples of adders. Uh, we have a decoder, some carry out circuits, and output. So it's kind of a small version of a uh, arithmetic logic unit. So you have AND gates and NOR gates and inverters here. So all of these SSI circuits are being put into these gates, which build upon each other, and then we can create uh, an LSI circuit. So now that we have, look familiar? Hey, for those of you who haven't had my class before, this is the MIPS data path. Um, we have the instruction memory here. We have an uh, adder. <coughs> Registers sh store local memory. The arithmetic logic unit, an adder to perform branching instructions. Um, then we have data memory, so it's like the higher DRAM type memory, or the memory hierarchy. 
and then we go back and do it again. So uh, without going into too much detail, this is how so an example of an LSI circuit. So a VLSI circuit is this is an ex, ex, this is a uh, layout of the Intel 404 processor. And what you're going to do for one of your assignments is you're going to take this small version of this Verilog code and you're actually going to produce this layout of the next data path. So, are you all familiar with Moore's Law? Okay, this is Moore's Law. So, basically, as the year goes on, the number of transistors that can fit into a certain amount of area increases or doubles every 18 months. And it's obviously not a physical law, you know, it's just motivation, but he did kind of notice it from a semi logger in the scale, so this is 4004. He kind of noticed around here, 808, oh, we're doubling this every 18 months, and now we're starting to get core two uh, quad core processors, you know, 2007 today. So now we're getting into all these core uh, quad core processors in order to be able to take advantage of uh, parallelism on a single chip. All right, so that should be, this should say N1.2. Um, so here's the actual chemistry of what's going on inside the transistor. So here's silicon. It has covalent bonds, the group by the element. So that means it has it can form one bond on each side, right? So if here this is a silicon in the middle, it has four valence electrons and it can form four bonds. So if you have silicon, you can actually create this lattice structure where they're all kind of in a row like this. So this one has four, this one has four, this one has four, this one has four. So it's very strong in that current doesn't really flow through it very well. So how do, you, how do we change this? It's this process called doping. We're going to put arsenic and boron atoms into the silicon lattice in order to create a, what's now known as electronical poles. And what's going to happen as voltage is placed on the, the different voltage difference is placed on the gate, we're going to create a flow of these poles they're actually going to move through this lattice in order to actually create the current flow. So current electrons go one way, poles, which are, if you have a plus and a minus here, your minus, your extra electron is going to be there, and a hole is going to be a place where electrons can go. If you want to be creating, uh, if you heavily dope on a silicon transistor, so if you have a heavily dope silicon lattice, you can create a transistor by using this metal oxide semiconductor. So to read 1.2, it states silicon is used as the basic starting material for the most integrated circuits. Pure silicon consists of a three-dimensional lattice of atoms. Silicon is a group four element, so it forms covalent bonds with four adjacent atoms. So we will define dopant as impurities placed in the silicon, this is 1.3, crystal to improve the conductivity. And the dopants moving through are going to create what are known as carriers. These are the free charges moving throughout the silicon. Uh, electrons are negative charge carriers, and poles are positive charge carriers. Before I move on, does anybody have any questions about this? I know I'm kind of getting this over the chemistry, and some of you may have thought you're, you're done with this after freshman year. I'm not going to expect you to remember everything. I'll, I'll tell you everything you need to remember uh, the chemistry part of it. So there are these things that exist called covalent bonds, and silicon makes them. I'm going to scroll past 1.2. So we first have an example here of n-type semiconductors. These are silicon-based semiconductors of group 5 elements, such as arsenic, in the middle. So what happens is instead of having silicon here, you're going to have arsenic, and you're going to have this extra hole. But the fifth valence electron is loosely bound. So 
is going to follow the bound that it normally does, but it's going to have this extra electron loosely bound inside of the uh, lattice structure. And I don't know if you can see this, but when you're watching the video there, you can see that arsenic has an extra plus, and silicon has an extra minus there. So, thermal vibrations created by voltage will, the lattice will set the electron free, leaving a positively charged arsenic ion and a free electron. So now you've got the charge carrier. You have an electron floating around the circuit. And as you create voltage, it wants to go towards the positive, right? That's how you create current. And so let me read uh, 1.6 for you, too. P-type. So now we have, we're starting to figure out complements. So our N-type semiconductor is being, I showed you the inverter, the N-type semiconductor, which is trying to ground. So what's going to happen is you want zero pushing these electrons away, or the negative flying away, right? So ground to the output. One, you want the positive, so you're going to want the holes flying through. So that's where these P-type semiconductors come in. P-type semiconductors are silicon-based semiconductors with group 3 elements, such as boron, which can borrow an electron from a neighboring atom. That silicon atom can borrow another electron from another atom. The hole acts as the positive carrier. So the fact that it can borrow another electron, so let's say Kevin is an arsenic and I'm boron, right? And I'm like, hey, I really want your soda. And since he's my grad student, he's going to give it to me, right? So this is the work. So well, since Kevin has the soda and I don't, this, this, this represents an electron, and I represent a hole, right? So I it's going to naturally flow to me when there's some sort of voltage, right? So that's how this kind of works. And so the way CMOS circuits are going to work is you're going to create these transistors in such a way that you want to create these networks to work specifically when you have certain dotted logic levels. So uh, later on in the section, we're actually going to be creating NAND, two input NAND gates, three input NAND gates. You're going to actually take a function and a small function to actually create a circuit with it. And so as you can see in this diagram, we have a boron dopant here and is able to create another electron. I mean, a, a hole there. So I'm going to scroll past 1.5. So a diode, uh, excuse me, we have markers here. So I know that the diagram is down a little further, but um, the general idea of a diode is you take positively charged semiconductor and a negatively charged semiconductor, you put them together to try to create that current flow, and then hook them to a voltage. So if you hook it up to a positive voltage, so you want to hook the positive voltage to the p-type, you hook the negative to the n-type, and then the current's going to flow when you officially hook it up. And if you hook it up the other way, remember I was talking about PMOS and NMOS, semiconductors are strong, you know, uh, PMOS is a strong conductor of zero, and NMOS is a strong conductor of one. So if you hook it up the original way, you're going to have strong current flow through the diode. If you hook it up the other way, it'll actually stop the current. So the positive is known as the anode, and the negative type, N type, is known as the cathode. I don't mind questions, don't be shy. I'd rather you ask a question. Does a question that makes you sound like an idiot it's better sound like an idiot now than during the exam? So, um, and I take time to answer questions. I don't mind it. I want everybody to understand. Um, 
I mean, it's, it, it can be. Uh, the, the two most common are arsenic and boron, just because of their proximity, proximity to the silicon in the Carolina Campbell. Yeah, that's the most common source of arsenic and boron. Okay, any other questions? All right, so I'm going to scroll past uh, 1.6. And uh, so just as I explained before with the diode, you hook up a positive voltage to the P-type semiconductor. When it works, the electrons flow this way, the holes flow this way, and you have current flow. And this is the electrical equivalent a triangle with a hole there. The line there and it flows just fine. Um, I scroll down a little bit. We see that if you hook it up the opposite way, it actually stops current flow because you're not going to create that movement of holes and uh, holes and electrons in the circuit. So the charge carrier is just going to stay put, to stay in play. And so the two terms for that, and this is not CGO at all, uh, forward bias and reverse bias. Uh, as a potential thing for a uh, second week topic, forward biasing and reverse biasing in, in uh, CMOS is actually used as a method to try to either reduce power consumption in the case of reverse biasing or forward biasing improving what's known as rise time. So you can actually talk to them about how does forward biasing or reverse biasing impact circuit operation. You can pick a paper or, uh, or article or something you see and say, hey, this is super Should be fine. Should be trying to figure out the interesting things. Uh, so I'll try to find your source, certain topics as uh, things like that come up. So, after, so for a long time, these diodes and what are also known as NPN transistors. So we won't go into uh, NPN transistors, but you're basically just putting another N pipe on, on the other side. You're trying to create this uh, base. And, uh, and gate and, and drain that so you had before. Um, and those uh, work kind of well. Um, CMOS or these metal oxide semiconductors tend to work a lot better. But NPN transistors, uh, or what's known as junction field effect transistors, JFF, um, they actually are, they work at much higher temperatures. So there's research actually being done at NASA to try to use NPN transistors on computer chips on Venus. So they're trying to actually make these work, and they're trying to actually send them. Because if we send CMOS transit uh, computers like they did in the past in the 70s, uh, they burn up after like 10 minutes. So that's not going to help you collect much data. So they're like, you can, so after some time, we, we put a probe on there, we get one photo of the surface, and then there goes your you know, $100 million project. So how do you use different properties of these metal oxide semiconductors in different environments. Things are going to work differently on Venus, where you would go up to 140 degrees Celsius, as opposed to Mars, where it can go down to, up to, down to like 120, some say that 120 degrees Celsius. So there's this huge range of temperatures in space, and people like you could potentially help them make that happen. So. But in the meantime, the computers that we use on Earth are known as CMOS, and these use what are known as metal oxide semiconductors, field effect transistors. So whenever I say MOSFET, that, that, that's what this is standing for. Uh, even though you can't see that now. No, no, I'm good. Oh, 
talking about, for those of you who haven't gotten my platform, I'm bad with names at first. Just tell me a number of times, and I'm sure I'll get it. Probably after reading your assignments a couple of times. Um, these were invented in 1963, and there are four elements to a MOSFET field effect transistor. We're going to have a gate, which I kind of alluded to earlier. Is, is there something I can do to help? Uh, it's funny. Thing. I'm going to take one. Oh, here. Probably my hair is going to be Now you're good. Fair enough. Don't stand up. Um, so there's the gate, which we kind of alluded to with that uh, PMOS and MOS inverter. You put the voltage on the gate. You have the source, which is where you want it to flow from, and the drain, which is where you want it to flow to. So the PMOS transistor with the, the source is tied to the supply voltage, VDD. In the MOS transistor, the source is tied to ground. And then the drains are tied together, which is why we can control the frequency output. So, the actual definitions I have for TGO 1.8 the gate is a polysilicon conduction layer used for determining transistors and an insulation layer of silicon dioxide. The source is the input pin. The drain is the output pin, and the body is the actual silicon wafer. So after uh, you guys write this down, and uh, we can go over a little more, I'll actually show you a diagram. So on your exam, I will ask you to be able to show me the what's known as the uh, transi transition gate level layer of a inverter. That's when I say transition level, you'll see that. Like subsequent TGOs, the wording. What I mean is, I want you to actually draw the gate. I want you to draw the silicon oxide in between the gate and the body. I want you to draw me the source and drain. And we're going to actually tie those together. We're going to see the gate, gate level, the transmission level, and then we're going to be going into something called stick diagrams towards the end of this section, which you actually see kind of how it's actually physically laid out. And do a little more. Uh, Put on state diagrams. If you're trying to lay, I mean, this is one of the things like, I feel is important to teach in this class because I want you to teach you good design principles. State diagrams are very, very useful in if you can design a good state diagram before you actually put anything into the computer, before you actually lay out the circuit. If you have a state diagram, you may have to force you some design rules to make it work, but there's a algorithm to do that too. But you'll actually have the actual physical layout so you know the steps that you need to follow. So we'll save you a ton of time in actual design. Okay, so this is uh, what a transistor actually looks like. So NMOS is a type of MOSFET where the channel exists between the source and the drain when the high voltage is placed on the gate. So what's going to happen here, and I'm actually going to uh, describe this in a diagram a little later, but here's what's actually physically going on inside the transistor. So the body in an end type transistor is a P type, right? So what's actually happening is when you put a positive value on the gate, you're going to push all your holes down. And what that's going to allow is you have two, the source and the drain here are actually going to heavily with electrons. So what's going to happen is it's actually going to create a channel here, and what's going to happen is your potential is going to flow from your source to your drain. <laughs> Same thing in the EMOS transistor. If you put a zero here, you have all of these electrons, right? The same thing, you're going to push them down, and then you have positively uh, source and drain, and it's going to create a channel between the source and the drain, and then you're going to have to flow through. And we're going to be learning about something called terminal voltage, which is what is the minimum voltage required to be placed on the gate in order to create this channel. And you're going to, when you play with H spice, you're going to be, you can actually determine that exact voltage by seeing simulation. So if you have, once you hit that terminal voltage, you'll actually get a spike on the output based on what you want. Before, it'll just be transient. So you can actually perform experiments using something called Monte Carlo simulation to actually find out that exact value. Does anybody have any questions on this? I know this is something I will ask you at once. Is 
that make it one of the things that are in there. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. No, this is this is actually really important. This is really important to understand uh, these kind of uh, these transitions at this level because this is physically demonstrating how it works. If you're if you're going into any kind of computer engineering job, you should be able to produce this from memory. Especially in Java. Yeah, so the S, so the, is that glass? Is that the SRO2? Is that what that is? Mm -hmm. So, so it's like the yeah, insulating layer. Yeah. So whenever you put a voltage on the gate, it just, the field pushes, uh, creates a channel. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so if you're hearing this, like, this is a very good question. Uh, the little inner off the left, we're actually going to be going into the actual step by step process of fabricating it. And that's exactly what I want to create this insulation layer. Because you want to make sure that you're not kind of, because if you're extracting these up here, so let's say, okay, so let's say we have an end pipe, right? So we put a one on here, we push these down, and we have a channel. What we don't want is we don't want these kind of go back to the gate. So we use that SIO2 there to the insulation layer. That's a very good question. Does that make sense? So let me read the word-for-word uh, -word NMOS and PMOS definitions for you. NMOS is a type of MOSFET where a channel exists between the source and the drain when the high voltage is placed on the gate. And PMOS is a type of MOSFET where a channel exists between the source and the drain when a low voltage is placed on the gate. So... What we're going to learn next is how you can how to put these two transistors together to create an inverter. Because you don't want the output drains to be tied together. So you're going to have your input, so you have zero, so your A input and then your Y output. Your inputs are going to have the same value for the gate, right? And then I'm kind of describing this a little bit here already, some of you, right? But when you put in a zero, what's going to happen is it's going to go to P type and N type. The N type is going to pull these up so there will be no channel. Here, it will push them down and create a channel that come from the supply voltage and you have a one on the output. So that's how you create the inversion. Same thing, you put a one, you go to the P type, the one isn't going to push the electrons down, so you're going to attract them. So you don't, you're not going to have a channel. Put a one here, pushes the hole down, the channel is created, and then from supply wall, I'm sorry, from the ground, it's going to flow to the output. So that's how you create the inversion on the physical level. Okay. And so CMOS, said here, stands for Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor. It's amazing to me the number of people. CMOS class and the other. What does CMOS stand for? They have no idea even though they've been doing CMOS the whole time. <laughs> and so the first uh, graduate assignment and extra credit for undergrads is what are the differences between a CMOS transistor and a FinFET transistor? And a small illusion, this link is available on uh, Blackboard for undergrads under extra credit or grad students under grad assignment. Um, but this is a really good description by a company called Synopsys, and you'll be working with some of their tools in this course, particularly HSpice, um, giving insight into these 3D uh, transistors where you're trying to use multiple gates in one decision logic element. And to kind of I'll go back to your question, and you're asking, oh, I'm sorry, what's your name? Jason. Jason. Okay, I'll go back to the question that Jason had. So most of the time, so. You'll be working a lot with like 0.25 micron feature size. We'll talk about feature size in a little bit. Um, one of the challenges that we usually dealt with in the dynamic 22 nanometer is something called punch through, where the glass layer wasn't able to hold the electrons anymore. And so that's when forward and reverse biasing actually became very helpful. How deep high biases to the 
substrates in order to actually prevent punctures. So, another potential topic for your, for your blog thing. Okay, so I've uh, this I've, I've told you pretty much everything in TGO 1.10 already. I've included this because this is a very common interview question. Describe and draw for me how PMOS and MOS transistors work, particularly as switches. So, as I said before, NMOS passes a strong zero, PMOS passes a strong one. Right? That applies to the gate. So when I say that NMOS passes a strong zero. When you put that value on the gate, whatever is at the source can go to the drain through the channel. But it's degraded or weak one, meaning I put a one on, on the gate, it's going to push down the, the positive uh, poles in the in the uh, bolt and will not be able to create, I'm sorry, will raise them up so it won't be able to create a channel. That's what we mean by degraded or weak one. Which means that NMOS is ideal for the pull down network. Recall the PMOS and NMOS uh, transistor uh, for the inverter, I'm sorry, PMOS and NMOS inverter, the NMOS on the bottom pulls down towards ground. NMOS is ideal to pull up towards the supply voltage. That's because it passes from one, um, oh, I don't, uh, if it's greater than zero, PMOS is ideal for the pull up network. So the idea is you put it at zero, it's going to flow through. Um. Here's an example. So, so for NMOS, you apply a voltage to the gate, you apply a one, it's going to turn on, so it'll flow through. When it's a zero, it's going to be off. PMOS, you apply a zero to the gate for PMOS, it'll be on. When you apply a one to the gate, it'll be off. So it's going to flow through. Think of it like, like a toll bridge. What are you doing? Let me look ahead. I'm going to look ahead real quick and I'll come right back up. Okay, so um, I want to explain 1.11 as well. Uh, 1.11 as well as how, it, how the channels are actually created. So before I show you that, does uh, anybody have any questions on anything we've covered so far? So, for those of you who've had my class before, what is that kind of, when I put little four stars there, what does that typically mean? Okay. Yep. So, these types of questions, this is very good. This is showing you actually understand precisely how you, you can, by asking this question, 1.11, describe the uh, transmission level of NMOS and PMOS and how channels are created. Well, 1.11 will have to do the exact wording. You can describe to me understand gate source and drain. You can understand what a transistor is. You understand what PMOS transistor is. You understand what an NMOS transistor is. You understand the physics behind it. You can tell me you understand holes. You can tell me you can understand electrons. This is a very good comprehensive type question in one drawing. Does that make sense? So when you put a zero on the end type, it's just like the switch before. Positive come up. Nothing happens here, no channel. When you put P type, you put a zero on there, then the electrons are forced down, and you need to create a channel between the source and the drain. And the more strong the voltage on the gate, the larger the channel. So I was talking about that terminal voltage, you're going to create a large channel over here, but it's going to get smaller and smaller until eventually uh, it finally reaches. That's where that terminal voltage is. It reaches that, that first point where you actually have the channel created. And then for enzyme operation, you put a one, it creates the channel again. And for P type, you put a one, it's going to raise up your uh, electrons so no channel can be created.
Yeah. So you said before that M mos passes a strong zero. It should have a strong. Yeah. Okay. So pass a strong. Pass a strong one. And then weak zero. And at B type is strong zero weak one. Okay. One tends backwards. Is it? Okay. Uh, That is correct. So this should be a strong one, weak zero. Yeah, there you go. Strong zero, weak one. And the diagram is correct. So Okay, this pretty much just describes everything we just talked about. And uh, this is a small little diagram of what the pull up and pull down networks are. You get your, your set of inputs. The same inputs go to both the pull up and pull down network. The pull up network has T MOS transistors. The pull down network has N MOS transistors. And then based on that, you'll have one gigabyte output. Okay, and so I've already kind of alluded to this, but now that we now know what's physically going on at 1.12, this is the transistor. Again, zero, then we have TMOS, then MOS, zero is strong, so it passes through, right? So now the channels created in the TMOS transistor, and we're able to create the flow from supply voltage to output. So it's zero, and MOS is weak on zero, so therefore, ground will be stopped. For one, for PMOS, it'll stop because PMOS are weak passes of, of uh, one. But NMOS is strong in one, so it'll pass the ground through the channel from the gate, put the source force to the drain, to the output. So you see how everything's kind of starting to come together towards building. All the, the miracle of electrons and moles to make little zeros and ones. Okay, so I'm going to scroll down a little bit to here. Okay, so at the bottom here, this is the actual physical layout of an actual inverter. So the entire substrate is positive, right? And then here we have our N loss transistor on the left, where we have N plus and N plus, right? So we have our source and our drain. And then the drain is going to come over here to the silicon oxide, okay? So we have the polysilicon here. That's our input. There we have polysilicon here. And then we have our output value for Y. Now, for the PMOS transition, this is our pull up portion. You have your source and your drain, and they drain to the same place, right? And so for that, we have to create an end well, right? Specifically for the P type transition. And this would be supplied to supply voltage. And it's going to be tied to ground. And we're going to be learning about metals. In this way, you can tie metals to pins. These are uh, pins here. How we actually, you can actually fabricate that in order to create a circuit. So let me scroll up a little bit. Uh, you don't have to draw this little diagram here. Um, I've, but I have just described what's going on here. When zeros are put on there, it's going to flow from. I'm almost, probably almost sounding uh, like this is ad nauseum at this point, but supply voltage will flow from through the uh, PMOS transistor when you place a zero on it. You place a zero on it here at the NMOS transistor, the channel is cut off. And when it's a one, it'll be the exact opposite. It's not flowing into the glass. No, this is, I don't, I took this from the slide out to see what's going on here. I don't think those are the same though. Right. It's a different pen. Okay, so it's, yeah. So basically, um, I, I took this from the slides. Um, the general idea is that 
there's going to be something called a pin here. And it, it's, so this isn't totally complete. The pin is similar to, you see how this polysilicon here, it's surrounded by glass. So there's going to be a pin here. That's a, that's a good question. Um, so that's a fair question. Um, what's going to happen is you're going to be learning how to create contacts with something called vias. Um, for those of you who've had them before, right now the, the I believe button is in full effect. For those of you who haven't, we haven't covered something, and I, I know it's going to be covered later. I just pressed the I believe button. I was in a nuclear power school, it probably sounds a little disturbing that they told the nuclear power people, I believe, I believe, but um, you, we will get to this whole concept of contact. So you're going to have contact here, you're going to have contact here, you're going to have contact here, that allows you to actually properly transmit. But you're going to have this here to ensure, basically to ensure that you're not uh, having the, uh, the doped source and uh, drain flowing back up through the polysilicon. You want it to flow this way. And we'll actually kind of go through the whole process of fabrication that will hopefully uh, clarify things for you. And we might actually be able to do that without, because uh, the fabrication isn't actually any topical guide objective. So it's kind of, you can sit back and watch the process. I'm in the same thing with one here. Okay, so um, creating a complementary network for more than just an inverter. Um, in order to do that, you want to make a quick review of De Morgan's laws. Recall that negative P and Q is equal to not P or not Q. <laughs> Q never, ever, 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 effing equals Q not. Um, I was referring to a story when we were talking about um, uh, flow blocks in nuclear power school. And this Senior chief man, he's gotten a lot of work in the Martian. And uh, we were working, you know, working on states where you're trying to determine when Q and when Q not. So, so he was kind of trying to emphasize over and over again that they should never be the same. It's Q bar, it's the, supposed to be the opposite of Q. So at one point, somebody did say, I'm going to go to Thomas and. I'm sorry. Um, but somebody solves the problem, and he comes out of both points. He just jumps up on his table and goes, so I would never make that mistake again, because it was kind of horrifying, but sure it was for you right now. Um, great man, I was like, oh, what? What is he going to do to this day? Just stop. But um, P, uh, so the other portion of the party's law is if yeah, not P or Q, is equivalent to not P and not Q. And by using these diversions laws, you can actually figure out the exact layout of the transistors. So these steps are 1.15, this is the algorithm. This is the thing that I wish I had been taught when I took this course. Um, you start out with your, your equation, right? And so n mass inputs are added together. I wish, really wish I had a marker. Um, I can pull up a uh, example here. So accessories, notepad. So let's say we have A, B, or C. Very simple example, right? So we're going to start with a pull-down network. Actually, that's a better example. Let's do not. So we start out with not A, A and B, or C, right? And so the reason why you want to start with not is because since we've proven that N loss transistors are weak with uh, zeros that are strong with ones and D loss are weak with zero, I'm starting with zeros and weak with one. This means that this would be like a conventional AND gate. There's no flow through the circuit where you can just do it with a normal pull up and pull down network. You're going to do a NAND gate and then use an inverter. And we'll, we'll demonstrate why that is later. But we'll start here. So if A, B, or C, so in this first rule, what I'm saying is here the NMOS inputs anded together are in series, inputs ORs are in parallel. So what's going to happen is you're going to have two NMOS transistors. One of them's going to be hooked to A, one is going to be hooked to B. They're in series and they're both tied to ground. And then C is going to be in parallel to so the four, right? 
And so you can, and then you hook those two uh, circuits that you have to the output of the VM. And that's your pull down network. And at the bottom here is that there did exist an instance where there is not a combination that will create an output, invert the function, perform the steps, and then add an inverter on the output. And we'll have an example from where that is the case. So you can see precisely where that is. So then you performed a Morgan's Law. So we have not and C, right? But then we're going to have not again. So then this would be not A or not B, right? So now that's our equivalent circuit. And then we use this rule three. For the pull-up networks, PMOS inputs are anded together are in parallel, so it's the exact opposite, and the ORs are in series. So it's going to be the exact opposite. Of how, that shows how that works. So we'll, we'll do an example question, to, so hopefully that'll, and I actually have the exact algorithm with the problem. When we, in the example question, uh, for those of you who have taken a class before, I'm not going to expect you to write this on every problem. I want you to write it once so you get familiar with the algorithm, and then when you see it, you can just leave it out and just write the actual solution. I'll tell you what, what the person is to write. I know 115 probably sounds like a lot of gibberish, but once we go through a couple example problems, it should make a lot of sense. Okay, so I'm going to scroll up a little bit here. So, um, we're going to with this first problem, example 1.1. Uh, we're going to do a two-input and input NAND using a CMOS pull-up pull-down network by drawing the transistor layout. So here I've just drawn a simple truth table where well, let's say this was AND, right? So this is the output would be 0, 0, 0, 1 instead of 1, 1, 1, 0. So here's what there does exist an instance where there's not a combination that will create an output, meaning any instance where you have, right, so you have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, and 0 for the first three, right? So you have all zeros on the output. In order for this to work, there would have to be a pull down instance where a combination where you have a 0 would be able to place a, a 1 on the output. Since that doesn't work with hand, so we, we can prove it here, right? Since that doesn't work with hand, we have all zeros, the only combination would be 1, 1, so you get a 1 on the output, right? That means there's no combination that you'll, you can get the appropriate current to flow through to get a zero, you know, to get a one on the output. Likewise, when you have one one, if you recall, PMOS are actually four conductors at once, right? So if you have the PMOS and the pull-up network, the VDD won't be able to get to the output either. So none of the outputs would work for a conventional AND gate. So what you have to do is to invert it, like we've done here, to an AND gate where everything works fine and then just put an inverter on the output. So if, what we're going to find out is the NAND gate will require four transistors, and a uh, AND gate will require six, because it requires the extra C4 um, for the inverter. So let me scroll down here. Um, just, just so you know, that's the solution. That's the only thing I'm really going to expect you to put on the TGL. Everything else is to explain the step by step. So the, for the pull-up network, the NMOS inputs anded together are in series. So we're, this is block of AD, right? So the NMOS transistors are down here. So as you can see, they are, in fact, in series. And then you perform De Morgan's Law. So NAND A and B becomes NAND A or NAND B. ORs are in parallel. So you can see these are in parallel. Right? And now how, here's how this, let's see, did I include a diagram? No, I didn't. So I'll describe how this is actually physically working, kind of the same way with the, uh, with the inverter. Zero, zero. Zero goes to all four transistors, right? Zeros, PMOSs are strong, 
here. This one I had a two zero, so you can actually remember this. Zero, one will go out, and then again, zero, zero, so one will go out. If you have a zero or one, what's going to happen is this trans this PMOS transistor is going to be off, right? And one of the PMOS MOS transistors is going to be on. So if it's zero one, zero, this one will be off and B will be on. Plus, if they're not both on, you can't have it flow through. But since one of these PMOS transistors is on, the one can still flow to the output. But it's one zero, it's the same thing except they're in the reverse. One zero, this one's off, this one's on. This, yeah, sorry. This one's on, this one's off, so let me make sure they're backwards. Here, this one's on, this one's off, but there's still no complete throughout flow through. And then when you get one one, both PMOS transistors are finally off, so there's no way the one can flow out. We have zero zero. Okay, yeah, we have one one, then finally both NMOS transistors are strong. The channels are created. You have a channel that goes through the source to the drain of this transistor. Then to the source into the drain of this transistor to the output. So that's how it logically works. And the reason why I introduced the De Morgan's law is when you start getting slightly larger equations, you can actually perform this to tell which ones are going to be in series and which ones are in parallel. So before, this is the pull down network. If they're and, they're in series. You or them, they're in parallel. And so then you can lay it out. OK, so here, uh, I'm actually, this is the only thing I'm expecting, for example, 1.2. But same thing. We've demonstrated, I kind of told you how this problem worked already, where this problem is do the two input and gate using the transistor layout. So using that last portion of the algorithm, we can prove with one one here, if it's an AND gate, we cannot, we don't have an instance where you put in any putting any ones on the input. Well, we have some PMOSs that are strong zeros. You have to have some instance of a zero creating a one in order for the circuit to work. Likewise, since N losses are strong ones, you have to have some instance where you can put a one on the input. Get a zero on the output, and that does happen here, but because of the PMOS eliminated. Okay. So what you do instead is you invert it and then do the exact same problem. That we test 1.1. So this should just be simple. For 1.2, you just do the exact same thing and then add an inverter on the output. So I can explain this really quick. Um, here. This is VDD, this is VDD, that's ground, that's ground. Does everybody understand what all of these symbols mean? I just want to make sure just before. Yes, Colin. Using the transistor with a circle on the PMOS. So this is the pull up PMOS with a circle on it. That's the PMOS transistor without a circle with an NMOS transistor. I believe 1.10, the one that I had is strong and big backwards. Those are drawn out properly on that one. And we will conclude the problems with designing a two input NOR gate. So here, kind of doing the same thing, we can uh, do NOR A or B. So they started out there four, so it's parallel, right? So the end losses are going to be in parallel, as we see here. They're in parallel. And then what's going to happen is we can form the Morgan's law, right? The Morgan's law means this becomes and B, right? So it says and, that means they're in series. So that means the PMOS transistors are now in series. So by using that the Morgan's law trick, and we're going to be doing example questions later, uh, probably during the next lecture, where you can have A and B or C or up to five variables where by using that De Morgan's law, it actually makes the problem significantly easier. And I won't expect you to do this problem. We'll start with 1.4. So the full book assignment will be topical guide objectives 1.1 through 1.15 and examples 1.1 through 1.3. Um, I'll take the next couple of minutes, kind of just briefly show 1.4. We're going to review this again at the beginning. 1.4 is not due. Um, so here we have D or 
A and B or C, and it's all not, right? So we start out, we can use these parallel rules. So since D is in parallel by itself, it has its own plane, right? And then A is in series, so A is going to be in series. And since B and C are four, they are parallel. So they're all coming from the ground, they'll be hooked together, and then they have to go through there. So if you can tie these um, equations and the Morgan's laws into actual CMOS paths, so then this step shows all of the converting the De Morgan's law all the way through. So take the first step, it becomes not D and the remainder. And then here you break it down, this becomes A and A or B or C. And then the next step is changing this to not B and not C. And then what's going to happen is you can use that to determine the pull-up network. Here's D, and then A is going to be in parallel with B or C, and they all tie to BDD, and that's the entire um, that's the entire thing. So we're going to start next class going over 1.4. Before I uh, dismiss you, does anybody have any questions? We got four minutes. Feel free to ask anything um, about what we've covered. Um, I'll, I'll include a note to ensure that uh, one reminder 1.10 uh, that the degraded and or backwards in the middle. Um, does anybody have any other questions? Nobody feeling overwhelmed yet? Okay. So in that case, uh, you are dismissed. I will post the uh, video to YouTube, and I'll send out the link. And uh, if you have nothing else, have a good day.